Welcome to Remnant Online Followers. Please kindly subscribe. Thank you. I know you have a plan for your marriage. You have a plan for your future. When you are 20, as you graduate from the university, you relocate straight to Canada. You are not here. And the Holy Ghost now comes and says, stay still in Nigeria. And then election finishes. Behold thy president. <laughs> and you are now waiting. What is the plan for us? The first plan is that now subsidy has gone. Meanwhile, your whole salary is 30000 you now go to the filling station to fuel your car. To fill your tank is now 40,000. <laughs> the first thing you do is to park your car. <laughs> Welcome to the new face <laughs> of your country. <laughs> what will now happen? You will now know that it's better to submit to Jesus Christ though. The plans God has are superior to yours. And God will always prove himself. It may be difficult from the beginning, but after a while, you will discover that truly all things work together for good. That your stay in the country is actually the best thing that will happen to you. Are you following this? Because therein, the plan of God will be revealed to you. Look at the scriptures. Hebrews chapter 1 from verse 1 to 3. It says, God who had sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophet, has in this last day spoken to us by his son, by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the words who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. So you now see that, oh, Jesus is the reflection of the completeness of everything God has to offer. And if this is what God has to offer, I think what God has to offer is better than everything that I plan. So what do I do? I surrender to the will of God. So when you find men who surrender to the will of God, even though the going is still tough, it's because they are looking at Christ. He said, looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of your faith. I know since I refused to travel to London because God told me to stay in Congo, things are not yet working, but I'm still looking at Jesus. I know they gave me a job and asked me to compromise by giving bribe. I wanted to give. God said, stop. I lost that job and things have not been easy for two years. I'm looking at Jesus. At the end of it all, all things will work together for your good. All things must work together for your good. Some of you, you graduated with first class. And your uncle told you they are giving you a job in Exxon Mobile and they are sending you to the to the US. And that night, as you went to thank God, you now heard, My son, my son, I'm sending you as a missionary to the nation of Mozambique. <laughs> you say missionary? What do you are we even US is a mission feed? And we do missionary as part time. And you gathered your bag, you wanted to go, my son, my son, your destination. It's Mozambique. See, these are the realities of life. Oh. Some people think, if God speaks to me, I will obey. You are joking. If you don't have a reason to obey, you will defy God. Did you not read about Jonah? God told Jonah to rise up and get down to Nineveh. Known as Jonah stood up, the Bible said, he ran from the presence of God. Men ran from the presence of God. And Jonah went to Tarshish until a whale had to bring a whale had to bring him back to the city and thank God he aligned to God's plan. His life became prolonged, long, much longer, longer than his lifetime. Till today we are calling Jonah and he has become one of the prophets that is standing in the cloud of witnesses in the heavens. Listen, the reason we look up to Jesus is because he substantiates our hope. Because when we see him, we see God's plan. If Jesus didn't live in this world, trust me, not even me, I wouldn't have believed it's possible to live above sin. You know, the Bible, doctrinally, the Bible tells us, sin shall no longer have dominion over you. <laughs> when you see the power of lust on your inside, and you see the elements that has been installed around you to stir that lust and lead you to sin, you will almost say it is impossible. Even though the Bible said, if that same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead lives in you, he will quicken your mortal body, he will mortify the flesh, you will quote it, but Kai, you will tell yourself, my brother, no man is perfect. Every time you say no man is perfect, Jesus makes that statement a lie. Because his sinless life reveals to us that it's possible for men to be perfect. And he's not the only one that is perfect. The Bible said, you too, be ye perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So the reason we are striving towards perfection is because Jesus showed us that it's possible. And Paul said in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 3, he said, let us go on unto perfection. 
The apostles knew that it was possible to be perfect. How were they so bold to think it? Because they saw it in Christ. So Paul will speak in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. Be a followers of me as I am the follower of Christ. John will say, as he is, so are we in this world. So they have grown to that level where they have also been able to model the perfection that is in Christ. If Jesus did not walk the earth, you will know that it's possible to live above sin. Now we can say, don't sin. Now we can tell people, don't fall into sin. Now we can tell people, live above sin. And ourselves can, by grace, strive to live above sin because Jesus showed us that it's possible. If Jesus didn't live, that doctrine would not have existed. 1 Peter 2.22 NIV said, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. It's possible. And so James now came and James 3, 2 said, a man who can bridle his tongue has become a perfect man. If there was no deceit in his mouth, it means other men too can live above deceit. So the reason we know there is victory over sin is because Jesus modeled it. And that is the significance of a sinless life. Glory to God. Are you seeing the whole facts that sums up to become our experiences? These are the raw materials for a victorious Christian life. And they are all traceable to Jesus Christ. This is why Jesus is our portrait. Because it's only in him that you can find the completeness of the realities of God. Again, the death of Jesus further reveals to us the love of God. John 3.16 For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But have everlasting life. Romans 5.8 God commends his love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. John 15.13 Greater love has no, has no one than this. That a man should lay down his life for his friend. So the death of Jesus. Further reveals to us the love of God. So Jesus did not just endure. The limitations of humanity. As a demonstration of his love in incarnation he went further to demonstrate that love by dying on the cross for us so every time we speak about the cross it is not a wood where a man is hung every time we speak about the cross the first thing we are talking about is the revelation of god of god's love that god became man and it was god who hung on that cross naked making himself vulnerable so that in his death we might have life this is the first revelation of the death of Jesus Christ the manifestation of the love of God the second revelation of the death of Jesus Christ is the atonement for our sins if he didn't die the price would not have been paid because the Bible said the wages of sin is death so if death does not happen sin cannot be paid for he said without shedding of blood there is no remission of sin so when we speak about forgiveness as far as spirits are concerned, it's not that I'm no longer angry with you. I've forgotten what you did. That's a joke. See, the actual sense is that spirits don't forgive. There is no spirit that can forgive you. Forgiveness does not exist in the realm of spirits. When a spirit tells you I've forgiven you, it's because two things have happened. Number one, that iniquity has been washed away. The spirit is not seeing it. And number two, a price has been paid to appease for the anger of that spirit. So in Christendom, what happened is called expiation and propitiation. In expiation, the blood of Jesus washed away our sins. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see the sin. If he sees it, he will kill us. That's why when our sin was put on Christ, Christ died. God does not see it. The blood of Jesus washed it away. He said, as the, north, the south is farther away from the west, he says, so have I separated. East is far, farther away from the west. He says, so have I separated your sins from you. So the blood of Jesus washed away our sins. So God does not see it. And then the anger that God had towards us as sinners, that anger was put on Christ. So when Christ was struck on the cross, as far as God was concerned, he was striking every sinner. So the cross of Jesus is a revelation of expiation and propitiation. This is why forgiveness became possible. Forgiveness became possible because Jesus took our penalty of death. Forgiveness became possible because the blood that was spilled washed away our sins. Glory to God. So this is the second significance of the death of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21 The Bible said he made him that was without sin to become sin for us that we 
might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So there was a substitutionary transaction that took place. He took our death, we took his life. He took our shame, we took his glory. He took our weakness, we took his strength. He took our death, we took his life. He took our humiliation, we took his exhortation. He took our weakness, we took his ability. Transaction was going on on the cross. So that everything that we are, he became. And everything that he was, we become. This is why you are a new creation. Because of the death of Jesus Christ. So when we talk about the crucifixion, it's not about the wood. It's about the substitutionary transaction. And so the reason you come before God and you are confident that God is not angry with you is because once upon a time, Jesus hung on the cross. The whole anger of God was directed to Jesus Christ. So when you come to God, you come boldly. Not because you merit it, but because Jesus merited it for you. Glory to God. And this is why we cannot but continually thank him. Every other thing we are doing now by grace will become the basis by which God will reward us in eternity. If you know the love of Christ as revealed by the cross, that love will constrain you. The reason we live above sin is not because we are afraid of hell. The reason we live above sin is because the love of Christ constrains us. I keep giving this example. I'm not cheating on my wife because I'm afraid of her. And she is not cheating on me because she's afraid of me. The fidelity that exists between us is born out of our love and respect for God and for each other. I travel a lot. I can go around the world in two weeks. If I want to do anything, there are things I can do she will never know in a lifetime. And this is what many people who don't love God or love their wives do. Because she's not putting a satellite watching you. And there are places we go to, we run away because see, we pursue you. <laughs> you know, you are you are in a place where the fathers have broken the ground. So, you are enjoying, we are all enjoying. There are nations in Africa here, if you go to, women believe that if they sleep with men of God, they have favor. And it's not their fault. Those nations did not have teachers and apostles as their fathers. So, they were not grounded in doctrine. They only had intercessors and prophets. So, they manifested gifts and did power. But they didn't know the word of God. So, error was institutionalized in their way of life. You go to such nations too. Why do you think when we are traveling, we insist that one man will travel with us? It's also for insurance. You will come to some places. <laughs> a, a friend, a senior friend shared with me, somebody invited him to South Africa. And when he landed at the airport, they sent two Rolls Royce to pick him up. And he said, there were only two men, and those two men were the drivers. All the other people that came as entourage, about eight of them were all women and they were tall like goddesses he said if you look at their skin there's no blemish and they wore some you know some of those materials that looks like the skin of a fish and material will be floating on the body <laughs> the man the man said he thanked his god that see when he was about making that trip god now told him go with your wife he said, even God knows that he didn't have stamina to have survived that temptation. So Jesus weighed him and discovered that he didn't have capacity. He was about going. God said, go with your wife. He booked the ticket for his wife himself. And when they landed, lo and behold, eight serpentine goddesses came to welcome. Walking smartly and with all the pristine. You're welcome, sir. We are happy to have you. God bless you. God bless you. You know God bless you. You acting like fish around the man. Collected his briefcase. They went to hotel. The man said around 11. Even with his wife. Somebody came and knocked. Hello sir. We are around. If you need anything. Just feel free. Anything. Around 11 p.m. I don't need anything. God is my sufficiency. He thought, he now asked himself, this ministry, don't they have men? He now went to preach the next day. There were men everywhere. He said, why didn't they invite them? Pastor now saw him. Huh? You came with your wife? Pastor was shocked. He said, yes, I came. Ah. How did you now do with the, our host? How did you, did you enjoy your stay? He said, I enjoyed myself very, very well. After the first session, he took off. Why do you think many men of God can't speak the truth anymore? 
they give you some reception when you are going. They say, hope you enjoyed yourself. Tomorrow they will call you and say, we need help. You can't say no. Because you have been imprisoned. You have been chained. Oh my God. You don't know. You don't. May Jehovah help us to stand to the end. <laughs> to the end. <laughs> oh. You don't know what's happening in this world. Glory to God. But Jesus showed us that it's possible to live above sin. And finally, the cross of Jesus Christ revealed to us victory over Satan. See, when we go out to cast out devils, the reason we go with boldness is because we know that there was a legal transaction that took place and Satan is already defeated. That's why no matter how... See, those of you who cast out devils here, you know. Sometimes you want to cast out demons from a, a sister that looks weak. That you think you can just squeeze and say, come on, get out. And then you'll see. What do you want? You will look again. Yes, the devil is trying to intimidate you. I am the prince of the sea. I will destroy her. Forget all those drama. It doesn't have the power anymore. The battle is over. He said, having spoiled principalities and powers. <laughs> he made a public show of them. Triumphing over them by the cross. So the, the reason we are not moved by any... Why do you think demons try to present a show? Is to intimidate you. You say in the name of Jesus, the person starts hitting his head on the ground. Hitting his head. You have not seen some rugged deliverance. Though. When you say Jesus, the person will start hitting his head on the wall. Hitting the ground. He will stand up. I will kill you. I will destroy your family. Say, shut up. Get out. What do we get? This? Get out of there. Why are you talking like that? Because you know that you are coming on the plane of the victory that Jesus secured. So I don't need to feel anything to cast out devils. When I show up, I know there is a legality in the spirit realm. When I come, I invoke that legality. Colossians 2.14 Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a public show of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So when Jesus hung on the cross, he smashed Satan. He smashed him. That's why I quoted for you already. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. For as much then as the children were partakers of flesh and blood, himself likewise took part of the same, that he through death might destroy him that has power over death, even the devil. So in his death, he destroyed Satan. All the demons of hell gathered together and they thought they've got him where they wanted. When the time was right, he said, if that same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead. So the Holy Ghost went to work. Hiya. You know, on the cross, Jesus said, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, my God and my God. Why have you forsaken me? Because the Holy Ghost withdrew. But after the third day, the spirit of glory mantled him again. And from the head, the pit of hell, he stood up. And he didn't stand up as a lamb that went to the slaughter. He stood up as the king of glory. That's why when he appeared to his apostles, he said, all hail the king. All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It's on the strength of that power that he said, in my name, cast out devils. In my name, cast out devils. Don't advise them. Don't negotiate with them. Cast them out. In my name. When you show up, the moment you say, in the name of Jesus, they remember the battle that took place in hell. They remember. Demons don't forget. Oh. They don't forget. They have photographic memory. The moment Jesus showed up, they said, why have you come before your time? So they are keepers of records. That's why some of them are called familiar spirits. They can tell you the record of your great-grandfather. So if they don't forget record, they will also not forget their defeat. So every time you come, they are thinking you are coming in the name of an apostle. They think you are coming in the name of a prayer warrior. They think you are coming in the name of a fasting machine. So when you show up, you put your prayer aside. Put your title aside. Put your fasting. And you say, in the name of Jesus. Hey! The moment the Bible said in Philippians 2 verse 8. That he was nailed to the cross and died the death of a criminal. Immediately, he said, because of this. God gave him a name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. People struggle with demons because they don't know the death of Jesus. Satan was crushed. The head of the serpent was bruised. 
and every one of us. See, using the name of Jesus is a right. Oh. Only for those who are born of God. Only for us. That's why it's a ticket. Just like you buy a ticket to go watch a football match. You don't beg to enter. Come on, open the door. This is my ticket. It doesn't matter the size of the bouncer. The moment you show the ticket, it will give way. That's how we deal with demons. When they show up, you say, in the name of Jesus, get out. When they, they, they delay you, you, you'll get holy vexation. Come on, get out from there. <laughs> Everything we do, there is a basis. But many don't know. They are going to deal with demons and they carry their own works as the advantage. Hey, you will suffer. How many people cast out devils in the Old Testament? Did you fast more than, do you fast more than them? Do you pray more than them? The technology of casting out devils. I'm not talking exorcism now. When you cooperate with one demon to interact with another demon. To exercise full authority over demons. Unapologetically. As a show of kingdom dominion. Began after the resurrection. Jesus did it. And when he died, we got the right to also do it. And oh, how the apostles love to cast out demons. That's why when Luke was writing. He said the acts of the apostles. They were acting dimensions. Acting. People like Paul didn't even need to say in the name of Jesus anymore. They sent handkerchief. When the demons see, they will know this handkerchief came from somebody that carried Jesus. And handkerchiefs were casting out devils. If the handkerchief of Paul is casting out devils and you are struggling to cast out devils, you that carry the Holy Ghost, then you don't have, you don't know truth. Don't exhort devils. And I know the place of principalities and I will explain it to you. Because there's a place where we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We cast out devils because they don't have the right to possess men. They are disembodied beings. So when you come, you, you exercise dominion. Glory to God. Ah, we can't go far. You know, these things are sweet. So sometimes when you are explaining them, you charge. <laughs> they think we touch you small. When I started doing international ministry, you want to travel to some nations, they tell you, my brother, that nation you are going, hope you are prepared. The demons there, no joke. I say, there are no different demons anywhere. All of them were defeated by Jesus. And I'm going in the name of Jesus. Jesus is not only Lord in Nigeria. He's Lord in all the nations and in all the generations. Now go and study the, the remaining four. The fourth is the barrier. The fifth is the resurrection. The sixth is the ascension. And the seventh is the glorification or the enthronement. Now, let me list the significance. Go and study it. It will bless you. The barrier has four, five major implications. Number one, the barrier verifies his death because he had to die. So the, the barrier actually proved that he died. <laughs> so he was in the grave for three days. Glory to God. Because if he did not die, the whole process is a joke. Matthew 27, 59 to 60 shows us the barrier and proved that he died. The second significance of the barrier is that it fulfilled prophecy. It was captured in prophecy that he was supposed to die and be buried for three days. Isaiah 53 verse 9, even Jonah prophesied it and Jesus reiterated it in John chapter 3 from verse 13 to 15. Number three, significance of the barrier. It completed the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's the completion of the sacrifice of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 to 4. And then finally, the barrier assures us of the veracity of resurrection. Because if he didn't really die and was buried, then resurrection would have been a scam. So the barrier is what verifies the veracity of resurrection. And if I may, Number five, the barrier is also symbolic of our separation from the world. And that's why we, we carry out the sacrament of baptism. It shows that we are no longer part of the world. We are separated. Because when you are buried, you are completely separated from the world. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 to verse 4. These are the significances of the barrier. Then you have the resurrection. The first significance of the resurrection is victory over death. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 to 57. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. 
but thanks be to God, he gives us victory through Christ Jesus. So the resurrection gives us victory over death. Glory to God. Romans chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. He was declared to be the son of, of David according to the flesh, but declared to be the son of God through resurrection by power, by the spirit of, by power and the spirit of holiness. So the resurrection is where we have victory over death. If Jesus didn't rise, there's no hope of eternity because all of us would have ended in the grave. And that is why when he rose, he rose with those who died. The Bible said in Ephesians 4 verse 8, him that descended was the same that ascended. He said for when he descended, he led captivity captive and led captives in his train. And the Bible tells us that people in Jerusalem saw some of the old prophets that went to the grave. So those who were in the grave all suddenly have hope. So when we are preaching the gospel, it's not because we don't know what will happen. At the end, those of us who are alive will be changed. And those of us who have slept with the Lord, we will rise again. This is the assurance of our faith as Christians. Thank you for watching. Please kindly like, comment, subscribe, and turn on your notification bell so you always get notified whenever we post a new video. And don't forget to share. Thank you.